This is the poet in the poem from the Library of Congress. I'm Grace Cavalieri. We are on remote at St. John's College, which is known as the Great Books College in Annapolis, Maryland. And there is one in Santa Fe, New Mexico. We are with Eva Bran, whose interest is philosophy. And she has been on a senior faculty member for more than 60 years at St. John's College. And Eva, by my count, I got 67 years. Am I right? What? Have you been a teacher for 67 years? 64 years. 64. Years. And how long were you uh, a dean? Seven years. Okay. Long when... years. Seven <laughs> long years. <laughs> and when you were a dean, were you also teaching or was... I thought I would. I promised myself I would. It wasn't possible. You were so busy with that. Well, I would arrive and I played the flute. That was my uh, escape. I would oh. arrive in the office at 7.30 to play my flute. And you know this... what happened? People knew I was there. They'd come in at 7.30. So I couldn't play my flute. Eva, this is going to be the untold secrets of Eva Brown. So to continue, I want everyone to know who you are. You hold degrees from Brooklyn College and Yale University. Yes. You hold the cherished Humanities Medal and it is called the National Humanities Medal for your service to human thought. You were an archeologist, author of 13 books and we are going to celebrate the new one today, let me see. There it is, it's called Feigning. But I would like to begin by this, Eva. You were an archeologist. Yes. How did that inspire your wish to teach antiquities and to translate from Greek? How did archeology archaeology trigger all that? Well, it's the other way around. I've always been interested in the past because I believe that the past is the source of poetry, the only source of poetry, because when you look into the future and imagine it, what you're really imagining is the past with some embellishments. So the past has always been, how to put it, my favorite um, time ep uh, episode. And, and archaeologists fit at that. Yes, it physically. Up. I mean, that's visible past. You go into the ground, you go three feet, you're twice as far back if you go six. So that's archaeology. It's a, it's a, a past in actuality. Yeah. So it's a visible past. Visible past, exactly. And you have brought to us translations from the Greek. I have a, a wonderful book, Symposium, which is very clear, crisp translation. You have spent your life sharing this with your students. I wish to tell oh, everyone- uh, Grace, if I'm interrupt, uh, I have two bodies, two translation bodies, two uh, uh, people that I've worked with for years and years, I think almost 20 years now. Uh, Peter Kalkavich and Eric Salem, and we've done a number of translations, not just the symposium. Right, it's a triumvirate, I have to say that. It's a These happy three... triumvirate. And you know what? We've never had a fight. Even, so over, a, even over a verb, Eva? We'd had, we've had discussions, but we haven't had a fight. How never. does that go? Does it say you take this passage and share it, and I will translate that passage. Is that how it did? We would take uh, a week, uh, each week, a half page. So every third week, we'd have to come with a half page, and then the others, the other two, would critique it. And you mostly, it was mostly an agreement. It was always an agreement. I mean, we might uh, begin with a different notion but we'd always end up together it was, you, we, you, we, we always came together yeah you each had the same level of knowledge of greek 
No, we were different. Uh, we had different knowledges. P Peter probably, uh, Eric probably knew the most Greek. I would say I probably knew the least Greek, but I knew, uh, I was good on context. I knew background. And uh, Peter was just all around competent. So, but we were, we had different things to contribute. I am holding up a book called Feigning. Let me see how to do yeah, this. But it's not visible. Now, let's see. Is it visible now? Nope, not all of it, which is the point. A little, uh, up, a little, little up. That's better. That's it. People should, should buy it and then they'll get to see the cover. Okay, so this is feigning. What does that word mean, Eva? And how does it indicate what we're going to find in the book? What is well, feigning? Yeah, it, it has a wonderful etymology. You know, etymology is the word history. And it originally comes from dough. Uh, you can't always tell how that works, but uh, feigning is derived from the word dough. And dough is what you can shape things from. So feigning is a shaping. You can feign a literary character, or you can make a doll from dough. That's how feigning comes to mean. Now, if I wanted to describe what I think this book is mostly about, and you check me on this, it is about that all images, whether they're mental images or images in form, have a model somewhere. That they are not, nothing is original in our mind or in substance. It all has, everything has an antecedent or an archetype or an original somewhere. Is that correct? Well, it's really, if, if it doesn't have an original, uh, if it doesn't have an original, it might be itself original. But the word image, if you call something an image, what you're saying with the word is that it's an image of something. That's what the word image, image is relational. You say image, you mean something is the original. So to call something an image is to imply an original. But that is fascinating. You have some 250 pages that just talk about this and explore this. So I want to go into it a little bit more. Um, nothing that we create is an original creation. It is from collected memory of some sort. How does a novelist make a character? Well, that is exactly my question. Now, I have to tell you that after 250 pages, I don't know the answer, but I've surely gone into all the possibilities. One possibility that I simply don't believe is that the brain is the source. The brain is a necessary underlying, uh, it, needs, it needs to be there, you need a brain to think, but that doesn't mean that the brain thinks. That means it's a necessary condition. So uh, that's an, a non-answer, non-starter for me. Okay, uh, so the brain is not the source of anything. This, uh, well, it, it is the necessity, but it's not a source. I mean, it's, it's a necessary condition, but not a source. Um, it could be, look, here's what I really believe, I hardly, I amazed myself of being willing to say this in public, but I'll now say it between you and me. The ancients believed that the source was Mount Olympus and the muses were the goddesses who brought it down to those who were poets. I have to say that at the bottom of my heart, that's what I believe. Well, some people believe there is a divine source of energy in this cosmos which animates everything that lives and from which we take our ideas. Some call this divine, some call it God, some believe that's where the originals are. But you yeah. don't go into this. Yeah, I was going to say, 
that doesn't seem wrong to me. It's just too general. I mean, a general source, call it whatever you like, but you're not saying what it does. And the a Greek understanding, which I'm going by, you know, the ancient understanding, for instance, Homer, when he begins his poetry, he appeals to the muses and the muses come from Olympus. So that has a specificity that I like. You ask me where it comes from. I think it must come from some poetic heaven and there must be some messenger but search me, I don't know what it, what it really is. Yes, and because that can't be logically deduced, you don't really go into that that much. But I do, th I like but the I have a theory. That's right. Yeah. I, in fact, I, I don't think one should have theories about everything. But we do know that artists have collected memories, I understand, and that when a painter paints a picture, she is not creating something original. She is doing what? Yeah, the one reason that the uh, term creation doesn't seem to me a good one is that it really is reserved for divinity. And it means in one sort of central meaning, creation means do, making something out of nothing. Well, Poets don't make something out of nothing. They utter something uh, from something that they have in their soul. And my the question to which I have no answer is, how does it get there? That is to say, if we have a mental image, which is in our soul, or whatever people want to call it, consciousness, uh, where does it come from? And thus the book. The yeah. thus, thus the book. Yeah. You spend the whole book questioning and describing and, and illuminating that. Yes. Now I have dreams of people, Eva, who have never been seen before on earth. Where do they come from? That's the question. Where do they come from? Some, and again, there, there is a cheap and easy answer, but it doesn't really do it, which is that they, they that you piece them together from your actual memories. I've met a half dozen people of that sort. I put together the features, and that's the that's the fictional character. Doesn't work that way, I don't think, because the it, fictional character has a unity that a mosaic of that sort doesn't wouldn't have. You know, if I piece qualities together. <laughs> So these these come these could be Homo sapien from central casting. Like there's a central casting that I draw these pieces and create these pieces yeah. from. Let us talk more about the word image. Um, a second rendering of something. Um, what is inspiration? Before I go into that, what is inspiration? It just occurs well, to me. Literally, it means something that's breathed into you. In other words, a divine afflatus, a, uh, but it refers to a source. <clears throat> it's very hard to talk about inspiration without trying to begin to see where the breath comes from. Unless it's hormonal. Um, well, yes, that's a possibility, but how can, look, You've seen sliced brains, I imagine. Most of, of us have seen, seen slices of brains. I never saw an image in one of them. <laughs> so there is the magic that you're trying to explore. There is yeah, the I, look, I, want, I think this is a moment to say something about what's worth asking about. People sometimes say, have said it to me, but if you can't give an answer, what's the point of asking the question? Well, my counter question is, what's the point of asking a question if it's got an answer? And that wasn't in the book, but it could be the next book. Well, that, that's sort of the underlying notion of the book, yeah. <laughs> well, um, my, one of, I have some favorite lines from this book, Eva's top hits. One of them is, asleep, 
We are artists all. Talk yeah, about yeah. that. It's not very original, you know, of everyone who interprets dreams <coughs> thinks uh, that we have some ability to uh, receive images from some source. But as for making them up, that, uh, that's not an explanation because no one knows how, how we get to making up something that never was before. But why are nighttime images art? Well, because to be, to be a work of art means that it has an originator, a maker. And the claim that dreams are art is the claim that we originate them in some way, but we originate them as images from something. So partly we are originators, partly we are images. Why can't something be exactly like something else? Can't be, why can't it be? Why can't something be exactly like something else? Well, it can never be exactly like something else because it's not, it's a second something, right? I mean, even if there was something, even if there was a human being exactly in every detail like you, that human being would have to stand beside you. And I could count one, two, you wouldn't be the same. You would be number one and the next one would be number two. Even if you were totally identical. It's really, well, are, I don't, I, I myself believe there aren't any such beings in the world that are totally the same in quality. You're still separate in quantity. Even you say identical twins have one characteristic which is different. Yeah, well, they've got many actually. I mean, if you know them, yeah. But if they were truly identical twins, that is say, if every, if one counted the number of hairs on your head at this particular moment before the next one fell out, right? Uh, and two people, two, and twins had exactly the same number of hairs. And everything about them was the same. They would still be different in being one number one and number two, or number two and number one, doesn't matter. In other words, I mean, the formulaic way of putting it is, is they'd be the same in quality, but not in uh, quantity. Well, um, Plato, your favorite, says uh, he talks about his interest in Who Plato. Plato. Oh, Plato, yeah. Your best friend. I'm my best friend, yeah. Says, no, no, uh, talk, no not my best friend. Socrates, my best friend. Oh, okay. Well, no two things can be exactly alike. Uh, <laughs> so Plato is number two. Uh, he is interested in images, you say, appearance versus being. Yes. Appearance is a denigration of the real world. So is an image a second rate thing? Yeah, an image is always a second rate thing uh, in, uh, in some understanding of the word. Uh, but then there's something about the arts, particularly for instance about a painting that is uh, that gives the lie to this claim, right? Because what I'm thinking of, if you go to a museum, you see a painting of a burger who lived in the 16th century in Holland, right? The guy himself is gone and no one cares, but his image is worth millions. <laughs> you, you, you use the example of Van Gogh. Yeah. And what was that example? Do you remember writing that? Yeah, but I forget what example it, I can actually use. It was if we saw Van Gogh's shoes, they wouldn't, the a picture of his shoes, the painting. Yeah, all those, those boots, yeah. You know, they're old, worn out boots. 
and the objects themselves. Well, it's funny, but I was going to say they aren't worth anything. A picture is worth millions. <laughs> but that turns out no longer to be true, but because of someone discovered in some closet somewhere in Holland, or, 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 or where's, where's he from, I forget. Anyhow, discovered that pair of shoes, they'd be worth hundreds of millions of dollars at auction. But to make you, let's not have it be Van Gogh's then, any old shoes would be any worth old. nothing, but a great painting of old shoes would be something. Well, not mine. No, not yours. Not even a painting would be worth anything. Well, that's what I mean. If I did a painting, it wouldn't be worth much. <laughs> this sounds, I want to tell everyone that this is Eva Brand we're talking to in celebration of her new book called Feigning. And she is senior faculty at St. John's College for 64 years, an active member of the faculty. And she has written 13 books plus, and we're going to continue talking about Feigning. Um, first of all, in chapter three, you have 10 examples of images. They are natural, artificial, mental. How did you meditate into those to get come up with those 10? How did oh. you arrive at those 10? Well, the first thing is you've got to draw a tub of hot water. And get into it. Understandable. Yeah. I understand. And then, and then you concentrate your mind on the kinds of images you know of. And you better bring a pencil and a piece of paper or you know, something. Was like that it. one tub full or more than one to get to 10 images? One was it one? Was that one? just one submersion? Or more than one to get oh, to all ten. Adjusted, yeah, from time to time, yeah. From time and to time, because you can just sit in a chair. Yeah. Well, that brings us to organization. Now, when you have a very big idea, it can be so big it can freeze you to inaction. So yes. here, you're. Let's start with the incubation of this idea of feigning, where you had to write. You had to sit down every day for a year to write this. What was the trigger for this thought? Well, you know, when I sat down to write the book on the imagination, um, I had a stack of notes. And for years and years, I discovered, and incidentally, this is something I tell my students, you know, when they're preparing to write a paper, and they tell me, a long and interesting tale of what they're going to put in it. I said, put it down immediately, because when you want it, you'll have lost it. And I got in the habit of always having pencil and paper and making a note. And so by the time I sat down, I had a stack, I'd say almost half a foot big. And then I cleared all the decks in my study and I laid the stack out in heaps. That made sense. And then it, I went through it and arranged it in chapters. And there was the book. Oh, that is, sounds easier than it is. Don't you think that your thoughts developed more, that there was not like a game of chess ahead of you, that as you went into chapter after chapter, that they, there became a progression that occurred to you? Or did you use these piles of paper as templates for a chapter? I did use them that way. Well, I wish I could see that manuscript. Save it. Save all those piles of paper. I that were... Actually, I did save it. I may have Good. thrown it out. Don't, don't, it. don't. I, was don't, confused, but I don't. think I've got it. <laughs> I hope you didn't throw that out. So uh, you have, but the here is the incredible part. The pages are peppered with quotes, reminiscences, actual books, philosophers' sayings, pieces of history. So all of those were in your mind for you to access 
And then when you needed that thought, you went to the source? Yeah, also, you... well, when I was quoting, yeah. I tried never to quote from memory because you always get it wrong. So I, I went, I usually had the source there. You are, this comes from a novel page so-and-so. And I know where every novel sits in my house. I go to it and I check, check it out. Um, <clears throat> I, I think when you quote, you should do it right. But uh, it's, uh, the nice thing is that if you pick up a book, you go to the thing you want to check out, but you also read around it. So you're always discovering something new. Just to have the book in the hand is good. Each page has uh, is illuminated by some great thinker, and it goes. It can be from Gulliver's Travels. It could be to Nardia. It could be to Tolstoy. So I see this as a bibliography of your reading life. It it's a a bibliographical biography or biographical bibliography, whichever way. You're exactly right, I think. I call it uh, Eva's literary travelogue. <clears throat> it's what has led you by the hand all these years. And um, I think the book was written by divine intervention. That's what I think. Inspiration is the name for that, yeah. So you do admit that you were in the zone. That I'm in, in a zone. That you were. That you were. Oh yeah. Of. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I'm not against helping that zone develop. And uh, some people, uh, I think this is not the best way. They drink. Yeah. But I, I have a, I have a cup of coffee, and the zone eventuates. That is going to give Starbucks a great plus on the stock market. <laughs> yes, Faulkner and Hemingway had, had other ways to alter their uh, experience, but you can get it through caffeine. <laughs> did you like writing this? Did you wake up and think, oi vey, I have to do this? Or did you just, were you just enchanted? I, I love doing it. Um, and uh, Sometimes if I didn't know, if I couldn't go ahead, I'd get very nervous. You know, I felt sort of like, a, I don't know what one felt like, but unpleasant. But then there'd always be a breakthrough, go for a walk, talk to a friend, mm -hmm. uh, or drink a cup of coffee. Yeah, they say that writer's block is a lack of ego energy. So that we have to oh. get in touch with our ego. I don't know what that means. People, tell, people say, oh, you have to get in touch with your feelings. You know, I don't know. How can I be out of touch with my feelings? In fact, the funny thing is that in my experience, which is very largely with the young, with students, and I wish I want them to get out of touch with their feelings. They got too many of them. So, you um, know what I mean. I do know what you mean, that um, it does clutter the atmosphere sometimes. Um, and, well, you know, I have a theory that we could not love a book if the writer did not love that book. That we cannot, as writers, expect anyone to love anything we write more than we love it. I yes. get a great deal- I know an example. I've been reading Patricia Highsmith, a very fine novelist who hates her book. It's not lovable. You know that? Well, I had the feeling, I mean, when I read it, that, that she didn't like any character. I mean, there's no one lovable in the book. It's very carefully done, but it's not done with love. It's done with some sort of intensity. And it's not, it's very, very interesting and difficult reading, but it's not pleasant. Well, I, I disagree with you. I think she loved hating her characters. Well, yeah, one could argue about that. I love, in fact, I've read the Ripley books and just sent one to your former uh, student, Mary Cochran. Oh, yeah. 
Paul. Yeah, from the 80s. Yeah. They, old students never die from you, Eva. They're always there. No. They're always no. there. Hundreds of alumni, hundreds and, they, and hundreds. One, one characteristic is that they never watch time zones. And if they live in California, you get call, calls at odd hours. But and, you get... And, and they, they're funny phone calls. If someone heard, they wouldn't believe it. Miss Brand, could we talk about God? <laughs> okay. Why not? That's our student. Yeah, Who else? Not? Well, Eva, who else could they call in the middle of the night? Be reasonable. Yeah, be reasonable. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, no one is talking about your other book this year. You just write two a year. Yes. And this was, um, is equality a necessary, an absolute good? Yes. Okay. Now, all of your books are Paul Dry books. And yes. he claims and you have written 13 under his publishing house. Yeah. But this is your 14th book. Yeah. Is Equality and Absolute Good is actually your 14th book. That might be, I haven't counted lately or forgotten. But. Yeah, but, um, and I did read it and I do want to talk about it. Do you remember writing it? To, to, to what? I'm sorry. Do you remember writing it? I remember very well writing it because I was as I'm not usually not, I'm usually quite content with the world, but equality gets my goat. I, it's, people keep demanding it and I don't know what they think they're getting if they're getting equality. I mean, do you know what, what substantial thing you've accomplished or, or uh, are in possession of if you're equal to somebody else? What's the good of it? I didn't think about it till I read your book. And then I thought a lot about it, but um, I could describe it. Let's see. It begins with Thomas Jefferson's uh, All Men Are Created Equal, right? Yeah, the man okay. I love to hate, yeah. And then you take it with all of that meaning, you turn that around like a kaleidoscope to show so many edges of that. Then, Let's cut to can the I, chase. Can I, can I say something? I regard this as the expression of my patriotism. You know, these days, only immigrants, refugees like myself, are allowed to be patriots. And the book, the book begins with a very careful inquiry into the first sentence of the Declaration of Independence, which is what you're quoting from. And continue with your thinking there. What you took it there? Where did you go with that? Well, the, the, the declaration offers a problem, namely the problem is, uh, what uh, if you say that equality gives you rights, equal rights? That makes sense. I mean, that you want equality of rights. So another person has the right uh, to a job. I want the same right to compete for that job. But equality as an absolute good, as not giving you access to this, that, or the other good, but as being itself good, that I cannot understand. I don't, you know, if, if I know that I'm equal to every soul in the world, what do I get out of it? Why is it, why does it give me pleasure? Does it give me something I can consume? Does it give me some substance? In other words, I don't see the good of mere equality. Well, um, I think that some people would believe that it means to give everyone an even break not that they themselves are equal. Yeah, that if, if it's equality of opportunity or equality under the law or this kind or that kind of equality, I can see. But there are people who are devoted to the mere thought of equality. They look, the first thing they look to is, is this, is this in favor of equalizing us? I don't wanna be equalized, neither up nor down. Don't Let's worry, see. Eva. Let's Don't see. worry. That will never happen to you. 
Well, it's impossible. <laughs> it's Thank impossible. You. Uh, really, I'm there's, no, there's no model. There's no equal, and there's no model. Well, it's, is it basically a political book? It's basically, I hope, what a philosophers call an ontological book, a book about the nature of equality. But I think my interpretation of that turns out to have a strong political application. In other words, one way to put that it could be very simplified. Given the choice between freedom and equality, I choose freedom over equality anytime. If one had to be given up in favor of the other. So that's political. And does communism seek equality for everyone? And ends up with being uh, a totalitarian. That is, I, I think the political uh, enforcement of equality is always totalitarian. That is, the government takes over and directs everything. But now, it, I mean, now it becomes real, uh, real politics. And I want to say at this moment that I think our current problem is that we don't have a thoughtful defender, a party that thoughtfully defends that notion. Maybe so, they don't understand it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and since it can't, I, I don't think there are very many stupid people in the world. I think stupidity is as rare as genius. So it's not stupidity, it's, it's just thoughtlessness. Or, Although or I've seen world. evidence, I've seen evidence of stupidity. You think? Okay. In, in Congress, I have seen a few people that I, say things. I don't know, they, they might just be super clever. Oh, super clever. Well, we're talking about the book is Equality and Absolute Good. It is the 14th book Eva Brown has written. She's in the senior faculty of St. John's College, which is known worldwide as the Great Books College. It has a branch in Santa Fe, New Mexico. There is nothing like its kind, and it is a harbinger of all the things that we hope to be good in learning. So Eva, Grace, I want Grace, I want to thank you for asking just the right questions to get me not, going. But this is you're taking your orals now, Eva. Now you know how it feels to take your orals. <laughs> You've given enough of them anyway. You've given enough, yeah. Well, I, I just read your book as equality and absolute good on the train, and it takes as long as from Annapolis to Trenton. So it's not a big book. It's about 120 pages, maybe? Yeah, and it much be... of it is notes, so it's it's Yeah, but it's pages. hefty, but it's got heft. And it looks like an author had something bugging them that she had to say. Am I right? And say that again? It looks like an author wrote something she just had to say, that it was bothering her. Yeah, that's absolutely right. It was bothering me. Mm -hmm. uh, but the books on the imagination didn't come from being bothered. They came from being delighted. But this book came from being bothered. Yeah. Well, it's very crisp reading, very clear reading, as is feigning. Feigning is very challenging, but it's easily understood because it's easily said. But back to absolute good. Let's cut to the chase. What's the answer? Is absolute good is equality an absolute good? What is the answer? No. Okay. But you do amend that in the book by talking about how people should want enough, but not more. Will you talk yes. about that? Yes. It, it seems to me that it would be good for public discourse if whenever people are moved to uh, uh, advocate for equality, they changed their rhetoric and instead advocated for having enough. See, if I have equality, look, may I show this? Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Well, zero, zero is equality. Well, you don't get anything from it. 
you know, here's, here's the scale. And if you put nothing on either pen, either pen is the scale. It's but what, what if it was, what if a hundred equals a hundred? That's yeah, different. Yeah. But it could be, it could be, but there's no guarantee. There's no guarantees, so I guess a better way to say it. Then that if you have a quality, you actually get something. You may not get anything. Or you may get something you don't want. You know, equality could equality could move you downward or upward. So it's equal it's, to it, what? In other words, equal to what? Yeah, equal to what? Or the better question is equal for what? For what purpose? There are. I know there are people. I've met them who are terminally irritated <laughs> by inequality. Right? Well, they should stop it. It doesn't make sense. They get nothing. Nothing they can really define out of being equal to the neighbor. They get. They could uh, be equal. They won't want, might want a house of equal size. That makes sense. You, know, you get a better house. But to be equal in some abstract way, I don't get it. You're talking about human nature. Yeah, I'm talking about human, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So um, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods has something to say. Yeah. Uh, but I would... Uh, you shouldn't peer around to see if there's some invidious distinction. Uh, it isn't only coveting, it's also just looking at people, you know, the squinty eyed uh, envy, which is what equality is really about. That, that sort of abstract equality. It takes a long time for me to teach my students not to compare their writing with anyone else's. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, should we not have billionaires? Sure, we should have lots of billionaires. In fact, I'm, I once had breakfast with a billionaire. <laughs> what do billionaires eat? He ate the same thing I did. It was a restaurant breakfast. It was very nice. So. And, and what do I care, <laughs> really? I mean, what's it to, that's exactly the point. What's it to me whether he has a billion? If you both eat one egg in the breakfast together, that's, yeah. to me, a form of equality, though. Well, but the equality is perfectly natural in that way. I mean, even, even if, if, he's, if he owns uh, all the uh, chicken farms in the world, right? And he can have uh, so and so many million eggs. What, what good is it? You still can eat one in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good example, a good example. So we should want enough, but not more because more doesn't really define no, us. I, no, I, I would put it differently. We should want enough for everybody, but mm -hmm. we might want a little more than enough for ourselves. Yeah. That's fine. That's as okay. Everybody else has enough. Yeah. You know, this, I have no objection to the billionaire uh, having vastly uh, larger living quarters than I do, as long as everyone has living quarters. Yeah. I would wish he paid as many taxes as I did, though. There's an inequity. Well, so if someone cuts, says should is um, equality and absolute good, you would say no. I would say absolutely no. <laughs> and then I would say to read the book to understand the many layers of that. It's not as simple as just no. No, it's not, not a simple thought, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, is there anything that we should know about your writing? Is there anything we should know about how you see the world and put it into writing. First of all, they're hieroglyphics, right? Writing is hieroglyphics, yeah. but they, are they well, making? Our writing isn't hieroglyphic because hieroglyphic means uh, that it's partly picture writing. Oh, okay. So writing except, art. Except oddly enough for the word, oh. Yeah. 
Oh, it's well, it's not picture writing, but it's audio, audio video writing. Oh, oh, oh. oh. wow. Uh, but just to, before we close, I need to ask you when you write, the words make visuals, correct? Well, the words do what? Make visuals, make pictures, make images. They make images, but you know, I have what I think of in the end as an advantage. I wasn't born speaking English. So I had reason to fall in love with English, which I now think without apology is the best language that ever was even better than Greek, which was my second love. Please say more. Well, because it's so flexible. And I think the flexibility which influences the way I write is that you can say anything you like as long as you know what rule you're breaking. That's the way English works. I've never heard that definition before. But try it something on, on what we think of as illiterate English or dialect a dialect English, it's always people who speak it well fluently, even illiterate English, uh, who know they're breaking a rule or to whom it's clear that they're using a different language, different uh, uh, level of language. And I think a good writer can use, can do practically anything if only they know what they're doing. Bingo. I have a perfect example of this. I saw a man say to another man, let's not war room this. Go right ahead and do it. Let's not war room this. He used war room as a verb. And she did it right. Isn't that great? Let's not war room this. Let's just go do it. You can do that in English. I don't think you can do it in other languages. So you can do it in German. Yeah. We have to pursue that more. I just want the world to know that we are talking to Eva Brand, and she has been uh, the author of two books this year. And Feigning is the book that I was holding up. I don't know if this could be seen. Yeah, it can be seen now. And I say, even and though- one, I should say one is a real tree and the other one's a paint tree. The lower one is a friend of mine, a painter painted that. And, Which and is astonishing, found, astonishing. Yeah, and then we found a tree in nature that looked like that tree. So nature copied us painting. Yeah. Perfect for your book. Yeah. I I have enjoyed so much. We will have to return with your new Thank book. You. Why is this called an aha book? Aha why did book? your oh. no, Why did publishers call this your ha book? Yeah, because uh, he said. Two books ago, I said to him, "This I've done no more," and I, he said, "Ha," meaning. <laughs> then I wrote the second book, and he said, "I said no more." He said, "Ha ha." Do you think there's going to be a ha 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 in your future? I'm not telling. Okay, this is the poet in the poem from the Library of Congress. We are on remote with St. John's College. And we have to thank Heather Latham and St. John's College for making this possible. We are so grateful. We are virtual. The program is produced by Forest Woods Media, post-production by Mike Turpin, MET Studios. We want to thank the Library of Congress for making the program possible. Our funders are the Sinipid Fund, the Ravada Foundation, and Sandy Jackson, Cohen. My engineer is Mike Tur Turpin, and I am Grace Cavalieri. <laughs>